fit area for one person to do, just for the record, I'm complaining. What's that? Oh, yeah, well, wait a minute, I'll ask you for questions. <laughs> okay. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're officially on the air. Good morning to all of you all there in distance education land. Nine people. Who are we missing this fine morning? Well, look around, somebody figure it out. Oh, yeah, Mohana. Oh, there's someone down there. There's a computer, but no Yeah, it's, it's his. That's Mohana. Yeah, it's where he was sitting in the last class. All right. So that's still leaves one person who'd be it. No, if Mohana's here, then everybody's here. Eleven. Oh, Tina. Eleven. Oh, we have yeah. eleven. Tina's, Tina's gone. gone. You're right. All right. Good. I don't mean good. <laughs> Good, we got the number, the first one. Okay. Here we are in session five. So today is, uh, that assignment is due. Most of you have sent it to me already. And make sure you get an email back from me that says, got it or something or resend it, because I always respond to let you know that I do have it. So if you don't get a reply, make sure you send it again or ask me or something. Okay, now there must be some questions about the service plan assignment. None? Okay then, comments about the service plan assignment. I already heard one you said before that. I just said it was, um, as I'm looking at the upgrade for editing for computer technology, mm. it's a huge upgrade. The two, mean, the two major nice. upgrades are that one and what other one has to do with technology? Communication? Yeah, the recording listening device. and recording. Those by far are the things that have changed the most, but the other ones have too in significant ways. So. They, they require the most work. But it's, it's a good way to learn this whole, this whole service plan uh, itself. So if you have any questions directly, uh, like if, if you wonder if something appropriate or isn't appropriate, don't, don't hesitate to ask. And remember, uh, I've gotten a couple questions. And remember that we're writing this plan to contain every possible thing that any possible client could want. So you, you and when when you start thinking about, well, would this client or this learner want it or that learner want it, well that comes after you've done an assessment, then you go through and you have this huge long checklist and you pick this one and this one and this one and this one and not all these other ones. That's where the clients uh, background comes in and, and your assessment takes place and that's where all the like the person's uh, abilities and financial abilities and all those things come in not the making up of this plan this plan is made for everyone from the from the slowest learning person to the fastest from the richest to the poorest etc no other questions we're going to take off then on, uh, on this new information. Oh, no, not new. Syllabus. I finally got the syllabus done. It, uh, I made an attempt to email it to you yesterday twice. You still don't have it. <laughs> but it's being sent this morning. And I'll have a paper copy down here before we leave this morning. So. Speaking of that, Pretty good timing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the syllabus in my email, actually. Yeah. At this very moment, I said, well, we're going to have a syllabus any second now. <laughs> Great timing. Get this hand and mouth. Passing it. It wasn't Janine. It, it was too. Tina. Oh, Tina. Sorry. Boo. Do I still have good timing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It did. I got came in with a spotlight on you. Boo. <laughs> 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 and, then, and, then, and then I 
got to make a fool of myself in front of everyone, so. Again. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, that syllabus is, is already sent to you electronically. If you have the ability to pick it up right now, you can. Not that it matters, we're not going to go over it, but you need to on your own. Basically, it lists uh, all the usual. I'm not going to go over the syllabus. You can read the syllabus. Okay, today, new stuff. We're, we're going to start talking about assessments today. Chapter three of the book. And we've already touched on this a little bit. We'll start way back at the at the beginning again. To teach anything, you go through a, a natural sort of four-step process. If you're teaching a little child to ride a bicycle or a, a trike or a if you're teaching somebody to throw, or if you're teaching somebody in braille, or if you're teaching somebody to read, you always go through this sort of four-step process, and the first thing you always do is, first thing you always do when you go to teach someone is, assess them to figure out. But why is it important? To establish a starting point. Yeah, well, why is it important to establish a starting point? To figure out what they know and what they don't know. Yeah, and why is that important? Why is it important to figure out what they don't know? Think about it from your standpoint. If you're the if you're the learner in this situation, why is it important for me to know what you know, know where to start, blah blah blah. So you know what to teach me, and you can measure uh, the outcome. Okay. What the person has learned. And? Set a goal. And? So you won't waste your time. Always. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the big one. So you don't waste your time and theirs. I and the biggest one, always think about your effect on people. Your, uh, your interaction with them, your, um, <clears throat> the way they accept you is starting in the wrong place does starting in the wrong place have anything to do with them accepting you as a teacher oh yeah mm -hmm. <clears throat> like what well if you oh sorry what? go ahead you sure? yeah. well if you assume the person doesn't know anything or has no method and the person does have some sort of a method for doing something then you're basically showing the person you have no faith in him and insulted. All right. And what about the other end of it? What happens if, if you're? Uh, this has happened to lots of people with computers. What about the other end of it? What happens if the person starts wanging on about something about five steps above your knowledge base? So you're frustrated to give up. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the effect on you from that person. <coughs> But you're right. Obviously, they will get frustrated and give up. When they think, but what's it do to your? What does it do to your rapport? What are they going to think of you if you start way ahead? Makes you look like you're not prepared. Why would you start way ahead? I mean, why would someone start way ahead of you? Because they want to show off mostly, right? Or they don't even really care, one of the two. So that's exactly what you're going to think. If you sit down with your in your brand new guitar lesson and somebody starts teaching you bar chords and you've never even heard of it, you're going to go, "What? And this, this person sitting there wanging off these really cool chords and everything, and you're sitting there thinking, "Well, wow, you're really good, but you're a total bug of that, right?" I mean, we've all been through that kind of thing. And I'm telling you that you got to forget all about all the kind of teaching you've had in the past when you come into this this class in this field. You've got to rethink everything because the purpose 
of teaching is not necessarily just to get somebody to learn something in this personal adjustment training business. What else is it? In my opinion, it's even more important than relationships or rapport with them. That's important too, but rapport is part of the other thing. What happens to somebody who loses vision? What happens to their self-esteem? I was going to say, I think it's just a confidence builder. If you can teach them anything, it's that I can learn something or I'm still capable of doing something. And in essence, the reason we're teaching here, this kind of teaching is a kind of counseling. I mean, those of you who are brand new to this, if you lose something serious like vision, <laughs> your ability to get around, or, or anything like that, <laughs> some of you probably are taking 50A right now, that whole class is basically about this subject. Essentially, the person who loses that also loses a serious amount of self-image and self-esteem, and the whole process of rebuilding that is what personal adjustment training is about. It's not learning Braille. It's not learning to read with magnification. It's not learning to get around. It's learning that you're still who you were, and it's learning that you can still do these things and still be the person you were, which basically means rebuilding <coughs> your self-esteem, convincing you that <coughs> Convincing you that you're the same person that you can get that you can still be who you were. And as soon as the person, me or whoever it is on the learning side here, figures that out, then the sky's the limit. And rapport with the teacher is is absolutely basic to it. So you have to always be thinking about I gotta I have to I have to maintain a good rapport with this person. I of course even without that, if you're teaching an adult, even without that purpose, you're teaching adults anyway. And to be a good teacher, you have to, especially the kind of teaching you're doing where you're dealing with one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two people, I mean, in order to be as effective as a teacher itself, you also have to have this rapport. You just, you just have to. People aren't going to pay attention to you if they don't like you. Obviously, it will happen to people that don't like you, but you have, to, you have to spend a great deal of time thinking about that as well as how well can I teach something to someone. So all the time, keep, you have to keep both things in mind. The purpose is to rebuild this person's self-image by teaching these skills. The purpose is not to teach these skills, period, at the end. <coughs> so when you're doing this... Uh, so you do an initial assessment to figure out where to start so so you don't see what's that? Let me think of what the Piaget has a what's it called? You talking about his stages of development? No. He's got a he's got a he's got a a little uh, Principle, the principle of oh, um, <laughs> something novelty. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna Google. Huh? I can Google. Yeah. Novelty. Jeez, <laughs> I've said this word ten thousand times in my life. The moderate novelty principle. Here we go. Write this down, Piaget's Moderate Novelty Principle. It basically says that what you teach has to be novel enough to the person to, to want to learn it, but moderately, in other words, it, it has to have a background enough to be able to learn it, which is what this whole idea of assessment is really based on. In other words, what you're about to teach has to be moderately novel, which is exactly why you have to assess people. So 
would that be saying, like, if you decide you're going to teach somebody quantum physics and they have no background and it has no basis of reality in their lives, they're not going to learn it? No, it doesn't mean that. It means you have to start way back, that's all. Mm. At the very beginning. Well, at whatever they know about it, you have to figure out, you know, quantum <coughs> physics has a beginning and an end. It's somewhere in this, somewhere in this beginning and end, you have some knowledge about it. I have some knowledge about it. Whoever's teaching it has to figure out what that knowledge is. Most times the average person doesn't have a great deal of knowledge, except layman kind of kind of type knowledge. But the average thing is, you know, things like uh, uh, teaching a, a compass, for example. Some people know quite a bit, some people don't know much at all. But if you don't know what the purpose of a compass is, then you first have to start with the purpose. Excuse me, Pop. Did you still buy? Oh. Thank you, Tina. Tina. <laughs> <laughs> I called you Tina. Tina. That's hey, Tina. <laughs> it's because Tina walked in and I thought she was you with oh, these. Telling me how much good timing I had. <laughs> so she walked in the very moment I said, We're going to have syllabi in a minute. So I assumed it was you. See. Okay. I'll be Tina today. I'll see you later. <laughs> Somebody start these around. I hope that wasn't water all over here. Oh, no, there's not. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so the, 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 the teaching sequence is basically assess, teach, I mean, assess, plan, teach, evaluate. And that's how we're going to go about, that's how we're going to go about covering it here. Uh, excuse me. Mm. Do you mean by novel like the the background that you have? Say again. The novelty is it like uh, what you have in your background or the yes. knowledge that you have? No, no. It, it means that. Well, yeah, it, it, your experience. Okay. It has to be novel to your experience. It has to be new enough that you care about learning it. In other words, if uh, if you play guitar, for example, and you know all the chords but you don't know how to pick out single notes. Mm -hmm. Well, if I assess you and I, and I start with chords that you already know, then it is not novel. Novel means new. New. Oh, okay. Moderately new is, is the way to think about it. It has to be moderately new. to be interesting. <laughs> and it can't be interesting if you already know it. Okay. So, okay, so, so the assessment, assessment process overall, if, you, if we go back to this whole idea of, uh, of using the, the vocational rehabilitation process as a kind of a uh, model here. What's that whole five-step process again? If you become a client of the, of the Michigan Commission for Blind or whatever, then uh, before you're a client, then the commission has these five steps they go through to get you through the whole rehabilitation process. The first step is eligibility the determination. Path. Yes. The second step is Program assessment. The program assessment to see what all whole program is going to be to get you through this. The third one is to write that program. The fourth is personal. personal adjustment training where you come in. And the fifth is vocational training. Okay. Now, if we look at that process, then there's a whole bunch of places where there are assessments from the most general to the most specific. So the the very most general, the first assessment that comes along in that process is, even before that, eligibility determination is a kind of assessment, right? Uh, it's assessing your vision. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is, what you said, program assessment, so the counselor is going to assess you know, 
what your vo vocational goal is and where you want to go and what kind of training you need, etc. Then the next kind of assessment is going to be where it, at the personal adjustment training level. So now it's in your lap. So your first kind of assessment is going to be so-called personal adjustment or BRT assessment. So now you're walking up to the front door of this person for the first time or they're coming into your rehabilitation center for the very first day. And now they're ready for a personal adjustment training. It's now time for you to do some sort of assessing to figure out what personal adjustment training skills you're going, to give, you're going to give and what is the template that you have to pick and choose skills from the service plan right so you're going to use a service plan to conduct this assessment it has it has that personal adjustment training assessment has three parts I like all these number of parts. They help me remember. Anyway, the first, I mentioned these the other day. Does anybody have them in, the, in their head or on their paper? So when these people show up to your door, you're going to assess them in three ways, each getting more specific. Is that the case file? Before they get there, right, there's a case file that comes to your door, either electronically or paper. And the second, kind of assessment is interview. the interview and then thirdly you're going to observe them in action you're going to create a lesson and watch and see basically if if what you uh, what you thought was true after the interview really is true excuse me hmm? is it possible to make like a questionnaire or survey to assess some people we have one yeah you mean a form? Yes. Yes, and there is a form, and you'll get it for the interview. So is it under which one? Is it under there's the a case form study? There's a form also for the, for the case file. Okay. And um, let's talk about the case file. Uh, if, you, if you have your books, and please bring them. Uh, figure 3.1 is an example. Talk, go ahead and turn to it. But I want to talk about it first. And then we'll read through it. Oh. I'm sorry, I kind of I kind of skipped something. There is that personal adjustment assessment that takes three, that has three parts, right? But then, once you start teaching, there's another kind of assessment, an even more specific one, and that's basically a lesson ex assessment. That takes place, you said, after the initial assessment. Yeah, or it's like step it's like okay, like you now. You've now done this assessment and you've written a service, you've done an assessment, you've done a, you've done a, you've got the case files, you've got the, you've done an interview, you've done an observation, you write a service plan, mm -hmm. and now on the service plan it says, uh, I don't know, you're going to teach them, uh, or they, they need to learn uh, whole foods and first lesson is pouring. So the very first thing you have to do there is what? You're now in the kitchen. The first thing will be to make sure they can... The first uh, thing you're going to do is assess them again about what? Orientation. About to, pouring. Well, when you first have... So, you, so okay. I get it. How do you know they can't pour, though, if you have what I'm telling you about pouring? Huh? <laughs> How do you know they can't pour? You're going to find you, out. That's the point. If you haven't assessed them already about pour, hmm? you know, you have, talk you, to you really them. Haven't. You haven't done it that specifically. Oh. You don't get that specific until you get 
in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you might, but generally not. So you choose these things. Uh, generally, you go over with them. They choose. They say okay or not okay. But in general, uh, let's say you, you chose together. You chose more. And whether you can pour something or not. <laughs> If you said, can I, if you asked the average person if they could pour a liquid, they'd say probably yes, even if they dumped it all over themselves. So you also have to, it's not so simple. You have to be a, you have to be kind of persistent without, without pushing. That's why you have to really, to do an assessment. You get the person there in the kitchen in the very first little kitchen lesson, and you say, okay, today we're going to do pouring talk about what kind of experience they've had. Um, in the beginning, it's the same old thing. Uh, this is the very first lesson you've ever done, you're still thinking about rapport. So if there's any sort of conflict, then you just avoid it and you go on to something else. And then you come back to that kind of thing. If you would have interviewed me uh, when I was in this very first part, I would have told you that I want nothing that that I was really good with a stovetop. I, I didn't need anything to do with the stovetop. But to tell you the truth, I was scared crapless of the stovetop. But I, I could talk every one of you into believing that I didn't need the stovetop. I did. I was scared of that. Way more of it than it, and being on the street. So, but if you would have tried to push it on me, I would have probably run me out the kitchen. <laughs> so the point is, the same old point. In the very beginning, until you get trust from somebody, then you just have to lay back and say, if you hear something like, eh, pouring, that's ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. Then you go to something else and you write in your notebook, something going on here. I got to come back to this. What if the person doesn't want the service, so like, like do you know what, what I'm saying? Yeah. This is assessment we're talking about. We'll come back to that. Oh, if they don't want the service, then you're a then you're a wimp. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't want the service, you're not doing your job. If they don't want the service, it's because you haven't been a good enough salesperson. Is that right? Yeah. Now, there are exceptions. There are exceptions if they can already do all those things. But the usual they don't want is the I can't stage. The usual, the usual I won't do it is because somebody else does it for me. Or nine, 95 times out of 100, the usual is I don't want it because I'm afraid of it. Or somebody else does it for me all because of the psychology of, of uh, <coughs> adjustment to law. What if something that they are against doing is a very found, fundamental aspect, well, like course, cutting obviously. or using knives? Do you just have to sort of side, of course. you know, go on to things that don't involve that for a while? Of course. So it can be challenging. Of course. <laughs> and I mean, and there are things like, you know, there are ethnic things you have to deal with and such. But I'm telling you what, as a teacher, you have to be really, really good you have to be a great salesperson. And you have to believe in what you're doing here. You have to respect what people want and don't want. But you also, at the same time, have to know that they're scared to death. And what's the, what's the greatest fear between a teacher and a learner? <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. We did, some, we did a really, what I thought was a fairly cool study here. I don't know, it's been 20 years ago now. We hooked people up to biofeedback monitors. <laughs> we took them out on the street. Well, we did, we did these O&M things. We had them all hooked up to these just bio, biofeedback gadgets, which basically shows stress. You put, you put these elect, electrodes on the frontalis muscle on your forehead, which, you know, you basic frown, right? <laughs> when people are stressed, they frown, even if it doesn't show. The muscle tension in your front frontalis muscle is easily measured by a biofeedback monitor. Well, which one of the following things causes the most stress in in the subjects? 
coming up to the top of the stairs, coming to a busy street, running into an obstacle, uh, the teacher saying something to you, or crossing a street? I think it's the teacher saying That's something. That's right. Five times worse. Really? That's you mean right. in terms of correcting, if you did something? Like Any correcting? word. Oh. Anything? Yeah. Even like good job? Oh, no. no. Oh. <laughs> I, I like that. But, if, but there was a strong reaction even if you said that.